Hello, this lecture uh, is on an essay concerning human understanding by the modern era philosopher John Locke. Uh, this is, is uh, going to pick up right where we left off, taking a look at uh, Descartes' uh, uh, initial foray into the knowledge question. Uh, Locke is writing around a century or so after Descartes, and is well aware of Descartes' writing. And so uh, you can uh, assume that Locke is either going to solve some of Descartes' problems or else uh, simply add another. Uh, this is your author here. Uh, that's a, a painting of John Locke. He uh, uh, trained as a physician, although didn't really do much work as a physician, which is probably just as well. Uh, what passes to, passed for medicine in those days was um, nothing special, and this was more often harmful than helpful. Uh, but he was well known for his contributions to early modern scientific thought uh, that is uh, related to the material uh, that you've read for uh, for this uh, part of the, the course. Uh, specifically, he's uh, he, he's regarded as the, the founder of a line of thought uh, that is now called empiricism. Uh, Locke himself didn't use the term empiricism, uh, but uh, that's a, it's a word sort of uh, applied to the kind of, of thinking that he's, he does and that a lot of people followed him in doing. Uh, he's also very famous for his political philosophy, uh, very frequently read in a course like this one. Um, uh, very often I will assign that in a, in, in a course like this one, uh, not this term, but uh, many other terms I do. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, John Locke is sort of the official philosopher of the American Revolution. Uh, so you see a lot of characteristically uh, Lockean ideas in a lot of the founding documents and discourse uh, in uh, uh, the period of the American Revolution. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about empiricism. Um, again, this is not the, a term that, that Locke you know, uses in uh, an essay concerning human understanding, um, but it's, uh, it, it, it becomes the name for a view that, uh, that sees Locke as its first major proponent. And uh, look to the, if you look at the right here, there's a, a, a quotation from, from the essay. Uh, let me pull up my laser pointer so we can follow in there. Uh, so Locke writes, let us suppose, right, the mind to have no ideas in it, to be like white paper with nothing written on it. How then does it come to be written on? From where does it get that vast store which the busy and boundless imagination of man has painted on it? All the materials of reason and knowledge. To this I answer in one word, from experience. Um, the quotation continues, our understandings derive all the materials of thinking from observations that we make of external objects that can be perceived through the senses, and of the internal operations of our minds, which we perceive by looking in at ourselves. These too are the, fount the fountains of knowledge from which arise all the ideas we have or can naturally have. So this, in a nutshell, is the view that comes to be known as empiricism. Empiricism is the view that all of our senses come ultimately, uh, all of our, sorry, all of our ideas come ultimately from our senses. Okay. Um, and, and I want to be very clear uh, what this view is uh, and what this view isn't. Um, so first off, uh, one of the ways of understanding empiricism, uh, again, the view that all of our ideas come ultimately from our senses, is as opposed to its main rival. I think that makes it make a little bit more sense as a view. Uh, the main rival of uh, empiricism as a view, especially through the modern period, uh, was a view that, was, that uh, came to be known as rationalism. Um, and rationalism is the view that at least some ideas are innate or else gained other than by the senses. Um, and so that was uh, that formed a, a major area of philosophical debate uh, all the way through the modern period and to some extent uh, even beyond it. Uh, you can you can see threads of empiricism versus rationalism even in today's philosophical discourse. Uh, but the idea is that, uh, again, empiricism is the idea that all of our ideas ultimately come from our senses. And rationalism, there are many different forms of rationalism, because in order to not be an empiricist, all you have to do is say that at least some of our ideas come from somewhere else. It's not that the rationalists don't say that none of our ideas come from experience. Uh, they, they, they perfectly well accept that many of them do. It's just they say that at least some of them are perhaps innate, that is that we're 
we're born with them, right? We just come with those, uh, or else they are gained other than uh, by the senses. Uh, that is perhaps by uh, pure thought or reason or something like that. That's hence the hence the term rationalism. So that's one way of, of understanding empiricism. But I want to caution that uh, that empiricism shouldn't be mistaken for a view that it isn't. Um, so very often, if you uh, go to the internet and have you look look at like a one or two line explainer for what it is that Locke thought, which is sort of preposterous in the first place, but a, some a lot of times um, uh, very brief treatments of Locke will will credit Locke by saying, oh, everybody starts as a blank slate, right? You know, uh, and that's that's not quite what he said. In fact, you read the quote earlier. He said, uh, let us suppose the mind to have no ideas in it to be like white paper with nothing written on it. It's not a it's it's close to the blank slate, but it's not it's not exactly right. Uh, but in any case, that's that's near the here nor there. Uh, it's important to note that Locke did not advocate the view that people have no innate abilities no innate tendencies or no innate natures, only that we have no innate ideas, right? Uh, he certainly did think that human beings have a nature and that we have certain inbuilt tendencies um, and, uh, and inbuilt abilities, uh, but he didn't think that we had any any innate ideas, right? That's, that's, that's Locke's empiricist view. Uh, the much uh, the, 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 the much more thoroughgoing view, the view that, that we don't even have a nature, right? That there's a sort of a whole family of views that hold that either all or, or nearly all human behavior is, as they say, socially constructed. Um, those, those views are much more recent. Those are largely 20th century views um, and, uh, or, or what, what you might call postmodern views. Uh, there's a, a really uh, an interesting book I might recommend. Uh, this is a, this is a criticism of such views. Um, of course you shouldn't, you know, read just on on one side of things, but I, I think this book is a is a uh, lays out the terrain very nicely, um, and uh, I think it's a it's a pretty pretty well put together uh, book, right? So uh, again, that's a uh, it's important to keep track of what Locke sort of did advocate and what he didn't advocate. He did not advocate a very thoroughgoing blank slate view, um, but he he did think that we had no innate ideas. Okay. So now uh, let's take a look at uh, what Locke is trying to tell us in his essay concerning human understanding. And the very first thing that I want to do is I want to show you some things and ask you some questions. And if you're you're watching this, uh, then I, I need you to, 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 to you know, <laughs> you're going to have to talk to the air or you're going to have to talk to your screen for a minute. And uh, don't worry, it's a perfectly normal thing to do. Um, and so, again, we're going to start a little easier, get more challenging, whatever. So let's uh, start here. Uh, the question is, what is that? I'm going to give you a minute to answer. You don't probably need a whole minute. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So uh, when we do this with whole rooms full of people, uh, uh, what will happen is I'll say, you know, you know, what is that? People say it's a chair. I'll say, okay, is that your final answer? Then some people time to get more. That was it. It's a blue chair, a wooden chair, a, you know, a small chair, whatever, right? You know, but uh, it's a chair. It's like, okay. So anybody who thinks that's a chair, go and sit on it. At which point the penny drops for just about everybody. And in fact, I assume it's dropped for you as well. You were like, oh, well, okay, no, fine. That's a picture of a chair, okay? But here's the thing. If you're not careful, you'll end up saying things with all the confidence in the world, right? I, I, I imagine, a, you know, th three minutes ago, you thought there was nothing wrong with the answer, that's a chair. Uh, but only one pointed out, of course, it's a picture of a chair. Of course, you know that and knew that at the time. Um, it's just that when you're not careful enough, when you just use autopilot um, to, to answer questions or to, to form beliefs, uh, you end up forming beliefs or answering questions in ways that are clearly, clearly false. So saying, for example, saying this is a chair. And and this is this is just a general point about philosophical methodology that we have to be on our guard, not to just assume things are a certain way and just take the first thing that comes into our head at, at you know as, as if it's very valuable. We have to be very, very careful. Um, and so I will say this, um, realizing that this is a picture of a chair is, is a really important intellectual step all by itself. Uh, understanding the difference between the image of a thing and the thing itself is very critical to picking up what Locke is putting down. Locke is going to try and tell us a lot about the difference between our ideas of things 
and the things themselves. And the difference between those is very much like the difference between an image of a thing and the thing itself. And in fact, he, he says so, right, you know, toward the, the beginning of, of, of this part of the essay. So uh, he says, to reveal the nature of our ideas better, to talk about them intelligibly, it will be convenient to distinguish them as they are ideas or perceptions in our minds, and as they are states of matter in the bodies that cause such perceptions in us. That may save us from the belief, which is perhaps the common opinion, that the ideas are exactly the images and resemblances of something inherent in the object. That belief is quite wrong. Um, so again, uh, Locke starts off, he, you know, he says, be very, very careful not to mix up your idea of a thing with the thing itself. And that's, you know, very much like mixing the image of a thing up with the thing itself. He says, that's, you know, like the, don't, don't assume that everything, uh, that objects are just the exact resemblances or exact images of something inherent in the object itself. He says, that's going to be, that's quite wrong. And so ideas, in short, are the entities that the mind deals with, right? Your mind can deal with ideas. That's all it can deal with, not actual objects. So, for example, when you look at a mountain, you don't gain any weight because you don't have a mountain in mind. You have the idea of a mountain in mind, again, which the idea of a mountain is not a mountain. Um, and the degree to which your idea of the mountain resembles the actual mountain the way it is, is uh, a matter of, of some dispute. And uh, we're going to get into that to, to some degree here. But let's follow Locke through this, right? So Locke is, is thinking through this in a very systematic way. He's a very well-organized thinker. He's a very or well-organized writer. And so one of the things he wants to talk about when he talks about our ideas, because we certainly want to understand those well, is where we get them and how we get them and what does that process look like, right? So he wants to explain, right, what he means by we get all of our ideas from experience. And so uh, let me demonstrate a, a, in a couple of ways how we get ideas. Okay, here's one. Getting any ideas? Hopefully you're watching this full screen, right? And like everything around you has, has, has become noticeably redder. Um, yeah, no, this is, are you getting, the question, are you getting any ideas from this, right? Uh, well, how about red? Are you getting the idea of redness, right? So yeah, that's at least that you should be getting. Uh, and, and notice you didn't really have any choice, right? You're just sort of like, if you're opening your eyes, you're looking at this, you're getting an idea of redness. It happens completely automatically. It's not something that's within your, your choice. You don't choose to get an idea of redness from this. You just do, right? That's just how it happens. And that's the first way that Locke thinks that we get ideas. He says, first, our senses, when applied to particular perceptible objects, that is, things that can be seen, felt, etc., convey into the mind many distinct perceptions of things according to the different ways in which the objects affect them. That's how we come by the ideas we have of yellow, white, heat, cold, soft, hard, bitter, sweet, and so on, the so-called sensible qualities, that is, the things that can be sensed with our senses. When I say the senses convey these ideas into the mind, I don't mean this strictly and literally, because I don't mean to say that an idea actually travels across from the perceived object to the person's mind. That is, he says, if you're looking at, say, you know, an apple, he doesn't think that there's an idea of an apple that, like, like hops from the apple into your 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 skull or something like he's like that's he's like that's not what's going on there's not an idea of an apple in an apple right uh, what happens is that your senses interact with the thing that is the apple and as a result of how your senses interact with that thing uh, you your your mind then generates some idea right based on again based on how whatever it is affects your senses. He says, yeah, I mean that through the senses, external objects convey into the mind something that produces there those perceptions, that is, ideas. This great source of most of the ideas we have, I call sensation. So these are his capitals. He, he wants to em emphasize this uh, on his own. Uh, so that's that's one kind of experience that Locke identifies, and it, he calls it sensation. That is, 
the 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 picking up of of ideas from our senses so not just our visual senses but what things feel like what they taste like what they smell like so any sort of anytime you sense anything your senses that is your sense organs your eyes your 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 hands your skin um your your nose um uh, your tongue they, they they interact with something in the world and then as a result of how they interact with whatever it is they generate some ideas and so anytime you get an idea that way, you've gotten an idea through what Locke calls sensation. Okay. Now that, that'll cover a lot of the ideas we have, but it seems like there are some ideas that we get in other ways. So for example, um, uh, if you take a look at this here, right? Uh, if I say, what's that, right? I, I assume you will have caught yourself and be like, it's a picture of a unicorn, right? But that's not really the, 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 the point of this one. Yes, it's a picture of a unicorn, but but you you knew what it was a picture of before I ever said unicorn, right? That's, that's really my point here. And believe it or not, this is actually a genuine but small puzzle uh, for empiricists. Remember, if you say that empiricists can only get ideas through experience, and yet you might admit that not only you but I all had we all had an idea of what a unicorn was in our head prior to this picture coming up and and whoever drew this picture or painted this picture or whatever you know however this picture was made um, they clearly had an idea of a unicorn already right they didn't make it up um, and so the idea is how do you get an idea of something that doesn't exist because of course unicorns do not exist and uh, if you're, I, I would encourage you to pause it for a second and, and, and think about how to answer that question. How do people get ideas of things that don't exist if we only can get ideas through experience, right? Doesn't something like that maybe just straightforwardly refute empiricism? Think about that for a moment. And when you think you have the answer, go ahead and resume. Well, of course, the answer is that empiricists uh, like Locke will say, look, the, the way that we can get ideas of mythical beasts like unicorns is because, notice, they're always composed of other things that we do have experience with. We have actually seen horses and we have seen horns. And so one of the things we can do in our minds is combine the two things together. Uh, so in fact, lots of mythical monsters, like a, a griffin, for example, is half eagle, half lion. Uh, both, both are things we've seen before, even though no one has ever seen a griffin because they don't exist. And so this is the second kind of experience that Locke wants to talk about. <clears throat> he says, the other fountain from which experience provides ideas to the understanding is the perception of the operations of our own mind within us. Being conscious of these actions of the mind and observing them in ourselves, our understandings get from them ideas that are as distinct as the ones we get from bodies affecting our senses. Every man has this source of ideas wholly within himself, and though it is not sense, because it has nothing to do with external objects, it is still very like sense, and might properly enough be called internal sense. I call this reflection, again his capitals, because the ideas it gives us can be had only by a mind reflecting on its own operations within itself. And so between sensation, between getting, getting ideas directly from our sensory experience and reflection, that is manipulating those ideas in our minds, right? Uh, separating them apart, comparing them, splitting them apart, combining them together, you know, moving them around, doing a remix, right? Uh, we can get new ideas that way. So between those two sources, it seems like we can account for all of the kinds of ideas we have. Speaking of kinds of ideas, uh, one of the things in Locke's essay is is the idea of you know, what, what kinds of ideas are there? Uh, and so he, he puts it this way. He says, the coldness and hardness that someone feels in a piece of ice are as distinct ideas in the mind as the smell and whiteness of a lily or the taste of sugar and the smell of a rose. And nothing can be plainer than the clear and distinct perception that they have of those simple ideas, each of which contains nothing but one uniform appearance or conception in the mind and is not distinguishable into different ideas. So Locke thinks that some of the ideas that we have are what he calls simple ideas. Uh, generally, when you see the word simple in, in English from this you know, sort of uh, rough era, uh, simple means doesn't have parts. That is, you can't sort of split it up into pieces. All right, so contrast uh, like uh, a baseball, right? Uh, you have the idea of roundness, of hardness, of you know, so redness, whiteness. You know, you've got all sorts of different ideas in there that, that all sort of combine to give you your idea of, your, of baseball. But uh, think of the uh, idea of cold 
right? Um, uh, that that doesn't seem like it has parts, right? It seems like it is just one one idea that doesn't really split up. And so, uh, so, so yeah, a lot of the ideas we have are, are these called so-called simple ideas, and uh, uh, other ideas that ideas that have parts are going to be complex ideas. That is, things that have have parts. Um, and so uh, he continues. He says the act in which the mind exerts its power over its simple ideas are chiefly these three, combining several simple ideas into one compound one. That is how all complex ideas are made, by like combining different simple ideas. Um, bringing together two ideas, whether simple or complex, and setting them side by side so as to see them both at once, without uniting them into one, this is how the mind gets its ideas of relations. Okay, so a relation is anything that requires sort of, you know, a relationship between two things. And we have lots of those. So there's like greater than, less than, heavier than, taller than, smaller than, lighter than, to the left of, to the right of, to the north of, to the south of, etc. Right? All of these are ideas about relations. Uh, that is the, a relation that one thing can have to another. Um, and so all of our comparative ideas are, are gotten through this notion of reflection. We reflect on the ideas that we have. And then he says, separating them, meaning our ideas, from all other ideas that accompany them in their real existence, this is called abstraction, and it is how all the mind's general ideas are made. So, for example, if I ask you to picture a doorknob in your mind, like, you know, close your eyes and, and, and picture very carefully a doorknob, likely enough, you are probably not picturing some specific real-world doorknob in all of its detail. You're probably just picturing any old generic doorknob that might be somewhat like doorknobs that you have seen uh, frequently or somewhere uh, sort of near you, but but it probably is just your kind of generic doorknob. It looks like a doorknob and doesn't look like any specific doorknob that you might perhaps have seen in some particular place and time. Um, and again, that's how you get general ideas, right? What, what happens is you take all the doorknobs you've ever seen and you kind of abstract out all their minor differences uh, to give you, a, you know, some sort of vague idea, right? A general idea of what a doorknob is. And that's how Locke thinks that happens. Again, he thinks that happens through reflection. And further than that, uh, uh, Locke uh, talks about what he calls qualities. Uh, this is one where I, I do wish uh, the editor sort of had updated the uh, uh, the term, but it's so well entrenched in philosophical literature that I, I can see why why to keep it also. Um, so if you think the, the term sort of properties or or features might be another uh, might be th those might have been terms that Locke would have used had been using uh, uh, 21st century English uh, instead of um, well, instead of written, you know, 17th century English. Um, so in any case, he says, um, whatever the mind perceives in itself, whatever is the immediate object of perception, thought, or understanding, I call an idea. The power to produce an idea in our mind, I call a quality of the thing that has that power. So uh, we, he's, he talked, you know, a lot about how we get various ideas uh, from reflection, uh, from sensation, uh, but now he wants to focus more on sensation here, and he thinks that the whatever it is, whatever it is in objects that has the ability, the power to create an idea in us by interacting with our senses in a particular way, is like, whatever that is, I'm going to call it, I'm going to give it the name of a quality. That's a, a quality that the thing has. Uh, so don't think quality in the sense of like being good or bad. It's just a quality as, as being like a feature or a property. And so um, he talks a, a, a very important passage about his, the difference between primary qualities and secondary qualities. I'd, I'd, I'd very much encourage you to uh, you know take a look at those sections, take a look at them very, very carefully because uh, they're very important for quite a number of things that uh, that come later. But let's give you some examples of each and how they work. So uh, primary qualities, to paraphrase Locke, are the kinds of qualities that are, are that cannot be changed. That you, you can't change anything about the object and prevent that object from being able to create that idea in you. And so here are some examples of primary qualities. These are, of course, not all of them, but these are just some examples. So the idea of solidity, mobility, and extension are all primary qualities for Locke. And what he means by them being primary qualities is, is let's go through them one at a time. So uh, take some particular object, like maybe you have a, a pen on your on your desk or something like that, um, or somewhere nearby. This is a class after all, so you know having a pen nearby would make some sense. Uh, so imagine so so imagine that pen, or take that pen, take even the actual pen, right? It's solid, okay. That is, you can't 
pass through it. That's what it means to be solid. So the pen, because of something about it, has this ability to create the idea of solidity in your mind. Right? It has the ability to, to you know, sort of call up that idea directly through your sensation of it, uh, through you know, picking it up, etc. And I should be, I should be careful to say that solidity, uh, you know, is going to apply to more than just um, uh, like the kinds of things that a chemist would call solids, right? So yes, it will apply to the pen, but it will also apply to things like air and water, right? Uh, because you can't actually pass your hand through air. Right? That's not what's going on when you wave your hand around. In fact, when you wave your hand around, you feel the air. What you're doing is you're, you're, you're pushing it out of the way of your hand. You're not literally going through it. Right? You're pushing it, the pieces of air out of the way. Same thing with a tub full of water. You're not going through the water, literally. You're pushing the water out of the way as you're moving your hand through it. And so, again, all the pieces of water, if you think of it that way, they're all solid. So let's go back to that pen. There's nothing you can do to that pen that makes it not able to create the idea of solidity in you. You can cut it up into tiny, 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 tiny pieces. But as long as those pieces can be felt at all, um, they can be they can create the idea of solidity in you. Um, similar with the idea of mobility. Mobility is the idea that things can be in first in one place and then in another place, right? So you say yes, but what if I glue this? glue this pen down to the desk like really good with like really great glue well you can move the desk <laughs> right or you can unglue it and then move the pen right i mean like uh it's just you know, it's nothing you can do makes the pen unable to create the idea of mobility and you it, it can do so uh, extension means that it has a shape that it takes up that it takes up the space that it takes up right now you can change the shape that things have but you can't make them not have a shape Right. And so that's, uh, again, the sense in which the, these are that's the sense in which these are primary qualities. Here's the downside about primary qualities is that we, we they, they, they do seem to be part of the objects themselves in some in some way. In fact, our, our pretty much our definition of object, right, is something that is solid, mobile and has extension as well as a few other things. Um, but imagine I sent you into the other room and said, oh, would you, would you go get me that object? And he's like, what object? Oh, you know, the one that's solid and the one that like, you know, is mobile and the one that has a shape. And I mean, notice that doesn't, notice that doesn't differentiate between one object and another, right? All objects fit this, this, this description. And so, um, there's a sense in which, uh, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a great, it's not great for individuating objects, but Locke notices that there seem to be a couple of these different sorts of qualities. One of them, one set of qualities seems to be not separable from the object, and the other one seems to be very separable. And it's secondary qualities that are very separable from the objects in question, things like color, texture, flavor, scent, etc. Right. So, I mean, color is one of those things that that uh, you know it, we like to think of color as being you know something that is in the object itself, right? But uh, really, the color is just an artifact of the way that whatever it is uh, interacts with your senses. Uh, you can you can change the object to cre have it create a different idea of color in you. So again, if you imagine a basketball and think that there is some essence of orangeness in the basketball, well, okay, look at the ba like paint it, right? Now all of a sudden the bo the ball right has create able to create a different idea of color in you, right? Not orange. Um, again, that's that's the, the color isn't something that's in the ball or in the object. It's just an artifact of how our senses work. Um, turn off all the lights. Does the ball still look orange, right? I mean, it's like, it's, does it still have the ability to create the idea of orangeness in you? And, and the answer is, well, no. <laughs> uh, it doesn't have any ability to create any ideas of color in me. Um, uh, look at the look at the ball through, like, uh, you know, say blue tinted glasses or something like that, and it'll 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 create a different idea in you. And again, that's not because of any change in the ball. It's because of a change now in the way that you're experiencing it. So again, um, color, our ideas about color are not in the object itself. We, we naively think that way, right? But but Locke points out that that's not that's not really accurate, right? You can you can you can change the way you experience all kinds of things to get different ideas out of them uh, with respect to color, and so color really can't be thought of to be in the object itself, uh, but instead that's just an artifact of how your senses work, right? Same thing with texture. Okay. If you, uh, I, I encourage you to do this to, to take a look at, uh, um, you know, the interrupt, look, look up, uh, what a billiard ball looks like under a microscope, like a real powerful microscope. 
uh, and you'll be astonished. It's very craggy and very rough, uh, lots of sharp edges. Uh, but of course, when you hold a billiard ball, you don't you don't experience any of that. And so the question is, which is the real billiard ball? Well, they're both real, right? I mean, they're one 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 way of experiencing uh, the billiard ball is is just as real as every other way of experiencing it. Um, you know, the, the 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 electron microscope that looks very closely at its texture really does exist, and so does your hand that holds the ball. Really, I mean, uh, there's again, there's no there's no sense in which you know, one of these things is the true billiard ball. Um, you know, what, what about something halfway in between an electron microscope in your hand in terms of its uh, level of scale and detail? It's just, it's a secondary quality. It's, it, it, the, our ideas of texture are not things that are in the object. They're things that are just artifacts of how our senses work. Uh, if you've ever heard somebody say that uh, you know, uh, the state of Kansas is flatter than a pancake, I, I picked this one because that's where I grew up. I grew up in, in really western Kansas, which parts of are really quite flat. And if you've ever had to drive all the way across the state, like on I-70 or something, you'll you'll notice that as you get further and further west, you know, the terrain gets, uh, you know, more and more monotonous. Uh, and I'll, I'll have to say, look, eastern Colorado is no picnic either, right? It's just as, it's just as bad as western Kansas. But... Um, but, you know, you might wonder. And so, in fact, uh, a couple of researchers some years ago uh, decided to sort of play around with this question a little bit. And so they went and they got themselves a research pancake and they took a, a detailed laser scan of the surface of the pancake. And then they compared that detailed laser scan to USGS images, uh, that is satellite geological images, topographical maps of the state of Kansas. Um, and the thing is, when you scale the pancake up to be the size of the state of Kansas, or scale the size of Kansas down to the size of a pancake, you find out that Kansas is far flatter than a pancake. But, but basically, every every par, big big enough chunk of Earth is flatter than a pancake, uh, uh, because pancakes aren't nearly that flat when when looked at at the same scale. So if you've ever seen yourself a pancake, there's a little bit of a bulge, you know, sort of in the middle of the pancake. Um, that bulge, when you scale everything up to about the size of a state, is is the size of, you know, the, the tallest mountains in the world in terms of elevation change. Um, you've seen that uh, like there's little pits and like air bubbles in the surface of a pancake. Well, again, you scale the pancake up to the size of a state. Those pits are like city swallowing craters, right? It, I mean, um, <laughs> it, it's nowhere close. But again, we want to say, what's the real texture of the pancake, right? Is it is it the texture that it would be if it were the size of the state or not? Or, you know, what's the real texture of the state? Again, it's all it depends on scale. It depends on how you experience it. And every way of experiencing it is equally real. So, um Again, this you know, texture is one of these things that, along with all these other things here, they're just they're just artifacts of of your senses, right? They're not they're not things that are in the object themselves, even though we naively think of them to be that way. So this is a very important part of what what Locke is is telling us. And so the secondary objects again can be changed, and so cannot be in the object itself. So it must be a result of how the object's insensible parts affect the senses. And so if this uh, didn't call up a kind of skeptical challenge, it, it perhaps should have, um, but but it, but if it didn't, here it is, right? And and so Locke thinks of it this way. He says, well, in addition to, and again, I, I, I mentioned earlier that we were either going to solve some of Descartes' problems or just add another one. Well, we're just adding another one here. We're not, none of this solves any of Descartes' problems. Remember, Descartes thought that our senses were not necessarily... Um, uh, vehicles for knowledge because of the fact that they are sometimes prone to error and also sometimes prone to illusion. That is things like dreams, hallucination, tinnitus, etc. Right? Um, all of those, you know, the, the, those, those, the, the problem of error and the problem of, of of illusion. Those are Descartes' problems. Locke is going to add this other different one. Keep in mind, this is a different problem um, because that's going to matter for all kinds of assignments after this. So Locke says, how shall the mind when it perceives nothing but its own ideas, know that they agree with the things themselves. Think about that for a minute. Picture this. Imagine that you're in a room, um, big concrete room. You can't hear anything that's going on outside of that room. You can't see anything that's going on outside of that room. You can't smell anything from outside of the room. You're, you're sort of sensor, your senses are isolated, right? But what you do get 
is you do get like a copy of a newspaper that comes through a very complicated slot, right? Um, so complicated enough so you can't really see through the slot or hear anything through there, right? Um, and 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 it just whoop, you just get that deposited. What you assume is once a day, right? Um, and the question is, if that's all you have is just what's in that newspaper, do you have any reason to believe that anything that is in that newspaper is actually happening outside of the room that you're in? I mean, it might be, it very well might be, but do you have any reason to conclude that it must be? Right? And if you're like, well, no, like, of course not. Well, notice that's exactly the position that your mind is in all the time. Your mind gets ideas from the world, but the ideas that your mind gets are always at the end of whatever sensory process, whatever sensory mechanism that there is. So something affects your eyes in a certain way that the eyes transform into all kinds of different signals and then the, you know a, a part of your brain interprets those signals and then passes them on and then you get an idea. But the idea is the end of that process. So it's a little bit like if you're, you know, if you uh, wear, wear eyeglasses, right? I don't, I don't suppose you think that, you know, the world is actually blurry until you put your eyeglasses on. No, no, no. It's just that uh, changing the way that things affect your senses changes the kinds of ideas you get from your senses. Um, and, you know, just in the same way as if you put like a, a filter on your phone camera, it changes the way that the camera's mechanism works, right? Either at the, you know, usually the software level. Um, but then you get a different picture out of it from the same input, right? From the same thing that you're pointing the camera at. And, and it seems like, uh, you know, Locke is, is saying, well, look, it seems like the ideas we have are that. They're like that, right? They're at the end of this process. And so how do we know what the beginning of that process looked like? What do, how do we know what actual things look like if all we have of them is our ideas? It seems like we'd have to be able to stand somewhere to look at our idea and then look at the thing itself and then compare the two of them. And I mean, we, we, we just don't, we don't have that, right? We don't have that ability. Uh, we can't stand outside of our own minds to look both at our minds and at initial objects. And again, look with what, right? Um, and so it's just, you know, the short answer is, is uh, <laughs> we, we cannot know the extent to which our ideas resemble actual objects. Now, some of the ideas that some of that sometimes people will come up with uh, to try and get out of this problem or try and, you know, sort of argue against it is they'll say something like, well, look, what, why, why, like, I, I get all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, you know, when I experience the world, the same thing happens over and over and over again. Of course, that has to be, you know, it's, it's consistent. It has to be, you know, a reflection of the way things really are. And I would say, go back to the thought experiment of, you know, being in that concrete room where you don't know it, you have anything but that newspaper. Say all of a sudden, instead of just one newspaper, you got a thousand newspapers that came through the slot every day and they all said the same thing. Uh, would Should that convince you that, that, that what the paper says is true? Uh, and the answer is, of course not, right? And so look, consistency is not the same thing as accuracy, right? You can be consistently inaccurate. You can be consistently wrong. Um, and so that doesn't really help us. One of the other things that says, okay, well, what about uh, other people, right? Um, everybody else sort of reports, right? That, you know, that uh, uh, what's what's going on. And, and, and surely that means that, you know, we're all experiencing the same thing and we're experiencing everything the same way. And so stuff really looks the way that we think it does. And stuff really is the way that we think it is on the basis of our senses. But again, imagine you're in that in that bunker, right? And, you know, you, you don't, can't hear or see anything outside of that bunker. But in that newspaper, it come, the newspaper comes with a whole bunch of letters that say, oh yeah, I'm out here and I'm, I, I, I swear all of this stuff is completely accurate. This is, this is what I see out here too. Or even better, uh, all these letters say, yeah, I'm in a bunker, but I'm getting the same newspaper as you are. I swear. Right. Number one, how would they know? <laughs> right. And number two, does that, does that, does it, should that give you any confidence in that paper? Uh, again, no, clearly no. You cannot have serious doubts about the way that the world outside of your mind is, and then take seriously other people who are outside of your mind. Um, uh, it's, 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 um, it's, that's a circular, that's a circularity problem. But you might say, oh, uh, uh, wait a second. But what about all those primary qualities? Those at least have to be 
the way that certain things really are, right? I mean, they're they're inseparable from the object. They have to like give us something of like reality. Well, not so fast. Um, uh, so Locke gives a great, thinks of this, of course, because uh, he's, he's he's very thorough, uh, and he comes up with a great counterexample. And his counterexample um, is 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 even better now than I think it was when he came up with it. Um, so Locke mentions that shadows, right, create a very distinct idea in your mind, but those shadows are really the absence of a thing rather than the thing itself. And other objects may, for all we know, be like that. That is, the, the, the distinct ideas that we get of things might be due to absences of one kind or another rather than presence, right? And he says, he's, really, we don't. We don't have any. We're not equipped to know the difference because all we get to deal with are our ideas at the end of whatever process experiences things. So consider this period here, you know, the one that I'm blocking with my with my laser pointer, right? Now notice, what does it mean to block the period with my laser pointer? Okay, but but look, but yeah, look at that period for a minute. I'm gonna move the laser pointer off the other side. Uh, what color is it, right? You know, what shape does it have, et cetera, et cetera, right? What texture is it? And you might say, wait a minute, what do you mean what texture is it? Because in a sense, I, you're getting a very clear and distinct idea of something being there. Right? You're like, no, there is a period there. Like, in fact, you would say that to somebody. Someone says, there's a period there. And, and if you said, no, there isn't, right? you'd expect an argument. Right? Not even a fun one. And, but, but, but really, is there a period there? Is there anything there? And the answer, of course not. It's, it's, uh, what, what's happening is that some of the pixels on the screen are lighting up and leaving other pixels unlit to give you an idea of a thing, very much like a shadow, right? Um, but, um, but, but it's, of course, not a shadow. It's like a shadow in this sense. Um, but, but yeah, you get this distinct idea of, of a thing being there. But there's no thing there, right? It doesn't feel like anything. It doesn't taste like anything. It doesn't, you know, taste like you're the screen of whatever device you're looking at this on, um, whether it be a, a desktop computer or a tablet, a phone, whatever. Um, that's, um, uh, again, locks like, as far as we know, all kinds of things could be that way. We just don't, we just don't know. We don't have access to the knowledge. And so because of that, I want you to look at this, this little section here, uh, because it's, it's just, it's too important, uh, to not be sort of read and experienced in the light of what Locke has said. Uh, this is, this is Locke's summary of what we sort of can and can't know and why. Um, and that's, uh, again, a tremendously important passage for, for things to come and other assignments and things, um. It's uh, um, but yeah, take a take a take a look at that and see uh, what Locke's goal is here. By being really frank about what we can't have, I think he has then a a really nice idea of what uh, what we can have, and then what it's what's 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 actually important to go for in terms of knowledge. So last thing I wanted to mention here uh, is that uh, you'll recognize this as a question from the uh, from from the survey, right? The the knowledge survey, and uh, I, I wanted to to sort of point out this this gambit of different ways that you could uh, think about the world, right? Um, and so one of these is, is 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 that our ideas about the world reflect exactly the way the world really is. This is the view that our ideas about the world are caused by the world and likely resemble the way the world really is. Or our ideas about the world are caused by the world, but may bear little or no resemblance to the way the world really is. Or you could even have the view, there is no external world. That is, there is no world outside of your mind. So the only thing that exists are ideas. All of these are, are, are possible views. Um, in fact, all of these three are, are, are views that are referred to as realist views, right? They're, because they're views that says that there is a reality that's independent of your mind. That's why they're called realist views. Um, and this is what's called an idealist view, right? Because it's the view that all there are are ideas, hence idealism. Um, this view is actually defended uh, reasonably uh, well by uh, a fellow by the name of George Barclay. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we won't really have a time in this course to go into uh, his ideas. They're very, very interesting. I'd encourage you to take a look. Uh, it sounds like a much easier... It sounds like this view should be easier to make fun of than it really turns out to be. It's, it's actually quite interesting. But in any case, I wanted to differentiate among these different kinds of realist ideas um, because, uh, of course, you could name them. One of them, this this one is, is, is typically called naive realism. Uh, and you're like, well, that doesn't sound very nice. Well, that's because it isn't. I mean, I think that it is a pretty naive idea, and that's why it's called naive realism. Philosophers are really good at naming things. Uh, we really don't have any reason to think that our ideas about the world just reflect exactly 
exactly the way the world really is. There's, um, we just don't have any good reason for, for, for believing that. And we have plenty of good reasons perhaps for not believing so. Uh, and so that might push you toward some something like a less naive realism that is that our ideas about the world are caused by the world, but and and likely resemble the way the world really is. That would be nice, but uh, again, a, a lot of people aren't holding holding their breath on that one. Uh, what Locke is trying to get through is something like this view, right? This is this is sort of the classic Lockean empiricist view, the view that our ideas about the world are caused by the world, but may bear little or no resemblance in some cases to the way that the world really is. And this is the this is the problem that that, that Locke is adding uh, to the to the knowledge question, right? Remember, Descartes already talked about how the senses are fallible or uh, that we are prone to illusion, right? That's not at all what Locke is saying. He's saying, imagine that your that your your senses worked perfectly, like imagine your senses never got it wrong, and imagine there were no such thing as errors. Uh, sorry, not errors. There was no such thing as illusions. There was no hallucinations, no dreams, no tinnitus, no phantom limbs, and nothing. None of that stuff. Imagine none of that existed. He said we would still have the problem where the ideas that we have come at the end of the process, uh, and 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 we don't have any way of, of of gauging what things are like when they first start interacting with our senses. Right, and that's just that's something we just have to live with. And get around as best as we can, um, you know. Otherwise, we're simply just in denial of of uh, of, of reality and a very important reality. <laughs>